everyone so much for joining us for this for us afternoon session, but maybe later in the day for you or earlier in the day for you. But regardless, thank you so much for coming to the Shift Ed Summer Summit. We are in the middle of our research themed day and we have more phenomenal content for you starting right now. So without further ado, a uh, couple of housekeeping things. We are recording the session, just in case you haven't been to any of our sessions. Uh, know that that's happening. If you have a problem with that, this is your chance to kind of dip out or turn your video off. We are going to post all of these sessions on our YouTube channel, free and open source to everybody. Um, and then also, if you would like to activate the live transcript function in Zoom, that is activated if you need just some closed captionings or you find that helpful. Um, so what we have today is a fantastic session uh, titled Climify, and if I can get the rest of it correct, Shifting Designers to Tackle Climate Change. Um, we have a community moderator who volunteered to help us with the chat today, which is Andrea Hempstead. Thank you, Andrea, for volunteering to do that. And uh, this panel came together at the very last minute. And so big, big thanks and kudos to Eric Benson and his two amazing panelists for joining us last minute to talk about such an important topic, um, I think, for the world right now. So Eric, thank you so much. And I'm going to pass it over to you so we can get started. All right, well, thank you um, and welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for attending. Uh, this session is called Climify, Shifting Designers to Tackle Climate Change. And uh, the goals of this panel is to help provide um, pragmatic and interesting ways for design educators to learn and share from each other um, and from climate experts, how they can best bring climate action um, into their classrooms to tackle um, our climate crisis and hopefully doing that in this fall. Uh, I'm your moderator and um, also a panelist. Uh, today, I'm doing some double duties. Uh, Eric Benson is my name. I'm an associate professor of graphic design um, at the University of Illinois. Um, I also run a nonprofit called Renourish and I'm a sustainable papermaker. Uh, I'm also the host of a new podcast called Climify in which this panel will be a special episode of later in the season. Um, our two panelists uh, are also on the podcast on their own in separate episodes. They're joining us today and I'll have them introduce themselves in a second. Um, so yes, this is being recorded. Uh, the goal of the Climify podcast is to connect design educators with climate experts, just like this panel, uh, to discuss ways to best introduce climate action into their classrooms. Uh, one of the great things about this show is that we also provide uh, design projects that the uh, climate experts actually write, so you can actually try them out um, in your classroom, so that's kind of a novel idea. You can find out more about that at climatedesigners.org slash edu slash climify, or more simply on Instagram at climify podcast. Uh, so before I introduce uh, Lisa and Katie, actually they're going to introduce themselves, before I have them do that, I just want to give you kind of a uh, how, uh, how we envisioned we can do this 90-minute uh, panel, and that is uh, we'll have them introduce themselves in a second, but then uh, and, and share with what they're doing, but also um, leave it kind of a, afterwards in kind of a free-form mode. We do have a, a series of questions that uh, I'm going to ask of them. If you have things that come up during that feel free to uh, post those and uh, we will respond um, sometimes uh, if necessary immediately. But we do have probably around 40 so minutes of panelist discussion with the rest of the time definitely um, geared towards uh, a discussion with you. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Katie Patrick and Lisa Zimmerman. Um, Katie Patrick um, is based in uh, San Francisco area. Is that is that correct? Uh, a little bit Valley. south now. I was. Now I'm um, gone just a little bit south down to the, the very suburban Silicon Valley. Gotcha. And uh, Lisa is based um, in Ireland. And so she is a little bit later in the day for her. So um, I'll turn it over to Katie first to get started and to have her introduce herself and, and, and what she is, is working on. Great, um, thank you, Eric. Now I've got a little bit of a slideshow I'm gonna go through to show you what I do. So I'm a, 
a little bit unusual in the design scene in that I studied environmental engineering and I'm really a core of a sustainability person, but I was raised in a very artistic family. So I'm kind of like half engineer, half artist, kind of bringing software and behavior design all together. Um, but when I do my little presentation, the story will all start to, um, will start to make sense. So I'll just jump into the screen share now. Oh, my dramatic ending was shown by mistake. Um, dramatic rainbow prism. Okay, can everybody see it all right? Okay, so usually this takes me an hour and a half to go through and I've tried to squish it down to five minutes. So I'm just gonna talk like really, really fast um, to, to, um, to make sure we um, it, it all makes sense. So now my mission is to really try to bring, make measurable environmental change happen as a environmental professional engineer person. And I came across this one phenomenon, which is a critical thing to understand when we're looking at designers who are trying to create change which is that education design and behavior design are completely different. And so when you educate people about environment and climate change, it works. People are educated. They know what parts per million are. They know about the earth and the glaciers. And you know what? They also care. So we can be very successful with climate design to get people educated and get people to care. But the evidence has shown over and over again through many studies that it doesn't actually lead to action. And that the art of action design is a completely different realm the art of educational and emotional concern. And this is called the value action gap, that we have a whole lot of environmental values, but they don't necessarily lead to action. It's also called the information deficit hypothesis, where people for a long time thought that if we just educated people about all this stuff, things would happen. And so this is a critical thing to understand, especially for people who are watching this in design, for people in sustainability, hardly anybody knows about it. Um, and so what it takes us into is really needing to understand the motivational core of the human mind. We're into the behavioral sciences of how you actually get people to take action. And we're really looking into the part of this design that I like to focus on is the reward center of the brain. The brain wants a cookie. It wants to be rewarded. It wants smiley faces, badges. It wants to be told it's doing a good job. And how we weave this into this style of design that I call Fitbit for the planet, which is getting environmental data like carbon emissions, forest emissions, air pollution. How do we get the data in the way of Fitbit gets the data, shows it to us in real time and shows us to it in a way that will actually create action. And then we can reward people love hearts, smiley faces, whatever. This is my sort of lifelong obsession to crack this, um, this nut. And so um, I've written this book called, it was so fascinating to me, this journey, I ended up writing a book called How to Save the World, which if you, this sounds interesting to you, I would encourage you to look at it. It's on Audible. I've got a podcast on it. I've got a book. It's all there on Amazon. Um, and now I practice this type of design and I, and I talk about it. I talk about it a lot. So just to try and put it in a nutshell, it's really starting to look at feedback loops of data. The best example of a really tight feedback loop is the Toyota Prius dashboard, where it's literally showing you in real time in the driver's seat how much carbon dioxide you're emitting. So how can we apply this feedback loop to any type of change? Um, one way that is interesting to me is, is like looking at ambient messaging. How can we actually put the emissions on a digital screen on the wall? How can we use color? That's what it means by ambient, meaning that it's not in an iPhone, it's not on your screen, it's actually in your environment. Elevators, staircases, foyers, um, the backs of uh, Uber, Uber cars, wherever. You know, looking something like this, so you cannot avoid seeing it. Could we do this with it? You know, air quality. Have air quality sensors show the data in real time out on the street. Could we do it with an augmented reality experience with particle sensors? You know, Internet of Things. And uh, you know, big displays, carbon emissions change uh, all rapidly throughout the day. This is a Chrome extension that I would that you can just look up if you just type in um, Energy Lollipop Chrome extension into Google. You can see how dramatically the carbon emissions from the grid change from hour to hour in the daytime. They're solar, they're right down to 2.9, then in a heat wave, they go way up. And most people don't know this at all unless you actually work in energy. So how do we put this data out that people can um, respond to? It can be creative. And this is where the art and creativity can really come into the data. Like once we've got the data infrastructure, you know, this is an idea of an orb that changes color. So it's both a public artwork, but it's also data visualization, but it's also nudge design, trying to encourage people to use less energy around the evening, um, the evening CO2 peak, and hopefully also engage in the political process of trying to get, um, you know, a 100% clean energy grid. This is actually a real light here that I've got arriving 
um, I think it's in a shipping container at Oakland Dock right now that will actually be the world's first um, real-time carbon emissions outdoor street. So it's like a Fitbit for the planet, but it's outside. It's out on the street so everyone can see it. So that will come true hopefully very soon. And a lot of this design is just about, you know, like how do you apply um, progress tracking? It sounds really simple. We see progress bars everywhere. But when you say, where is the progress bar for the planet? Where's the progress bar for getting, for getting the plastic out of the ocean, for decarbonizing, for buildings to reach zero impact? We don't have progress bars for any of this stuff, right? So beginning, everyone knows what it is, but unfortunately I have to still reiterate it. The beginning, the end, tracking progress in between and then rewarding people for their progress, the basic skeleton. If you could get reduce my book down to a single principle, it's just trying to like get designed to track progress towards a measurable goal, right? Simple, but it's not really um, done very well very often. And it doesn't need to be a bar. Like it can be dots. This is the one that I did with a slug. Um, and then you drag the slug over each dot and then each dot opens up into a zero waste uh, action. Or, you know, just using simple behavior charts. Like what people are talking about climate design, they're like, oh, how do we like emotionally educate people? How do we make it really interesting and really salient and get people really engaged? I'm like, that's part of it. But you actually have to get people to do action. So something really simple, like a behavior chart, you know? And I did this up, it looks kind of cute and fun. You know, I actually want to put my sticker on it every day to go for a 30 day um, you know, challenge or behavior charts that influence other people around us. You don't just need to influence your own life, your, you can influence 10 or 20 other people around you. And that's a really interesting type of design and how we actually create tools to, be, okay, you can reduce meat yourself, but how do you get five people to reduce meat? How do you get five other people to put on solar? That's the secret ingredient for how change happens, which is through social um, networks can be done with maps. This is one for solar. I looked at Google uh, satellite view. I saw where all the solar panels and then I mapped them out in a gamified way. No solar panels, you get a, a progress bar so we can see how we are to getting 100% solar. Sorry, and then everybody gets a smiley face when they get a solar panel in the community. It's a huge amount of opportunity we can do with maps with neighbors talking to neighbors and then giving people these badges and designing around this. And then you can have blocks of people groups people people change because they get into groups uh, another one to do with urban heat islands this is the surface temperature of summer you can see these are parks this is concrete and then using some behavioral science comparing one house to another house to see where you are that really psychs people when they are when they are compared we can do it with green cover there's nothing out there currently that tells you the green cover of every city with a basic percentage in a ui design like this doesn't exist then we can rank them ranking all the cities by green cover. Again, nobody's just done it. It's not that hard to do. We can use color, electronic color, sorry, that you know shows you um, your electricity used. Um, this is one I've been signing with energy. It's called energy lollipop that shows it to you. And the basic theme is color. You can, we don't even need all this stuff, all the other gamification stuff on the front, but it's the color that is the, doing the heavy lifting. That's the unconscious driver to get you to reduce your electricity use. And again, this can become more fancy applied to Magic Leap augmented reality where we could see the carbon intensity of all of the buildings. And obviously nobody wants to be the bad one um, that's in the red zone. Also applying it to vegetarian based eating, simple measurable ratio of plant-based calories to animal-based calories, star rating, color. Let's just move up the spectrum rather than a binary vegetarian on or off. We're trying to nudge people to increase their percentage of plant-based calories using uh, emotional animals. This is a robot cat. The robot cat smiles at you if you use less energy and it frowns at you if you use more energy. Fantastically successful. People are so responsive to the cat, bigger than anything I've ever seen before. Your electricity consumption goes down by 40% because we're just heavily responsive to faces. And I added this into energy lollipop where you get an egg and the only way to add the egg to hatch, this is just an idea, it's not actually built. Um, when the egg hatches, you have to keep continually reducing energy to take care of your energy animal that sits on your browser. Um, using this kind of emotional connection that we have with animals and with faces. Uh, you can also do pledges. This is so easy. Like seriously, getting someone to write something down and even need to build any software. You just ask them to write down their commitments and it really works. I've only done this a few times and people come back to me, this guy with the toothpaste, I saw him a year later and he says, I'm still making my own toothpaste, Katie. And I couldn't even remember his name. Like 
it, um, this guy started sending me all these pictures of his cups. I was like, wow, this stuff is like, it's kind of like, like cocaine, you know? Um, it's really powerful, it's really powerful. Um, and so overall, my overall worldview about trying to change the world is that we got to move out of this, um, this era of doom, shame and fear and telling people what not to do and into a new era of environmental change where we use imagination, solutions and examples. Where we're starting to say, what is the world that we are for? I just love these illustrations of eco cities, of biophilic cities to help try and encapsulate this vision of where we want to go. And you can see my Zoom background also has, um, has one. This, you should follow this guy, Vincent Calibot. He's an amazing eco-futures architect. If you haven't come across him before, I use his pictures um, all the time. And this one uh, is one that I did up, again, using augmented reality to potentially visualize the future world to help catalyze our imaginations and our creativity um, to make it happen. And I'm putting the seed out there that what we need to start is to uh, I'll start Earth Imagination Day. Earth Day is okay, but it's kind of boring. Why don't we have Earth Imagination Day where we all start imagining this future world and then reverse engineer it and it encapsulate this whole, this whole, you know, I have a dream speech for the planet. I feel like every single person needs to have their own I have a dream speech for what the future world should be. And that should be their own creative drive. And I love this illustration of the prism because I think sustainability and environmental change is often uh taught we often think about it as a sacrifice or a fight and i don't think it needs to be that i think it needs to be your truest creative expression of who you are and when you find the right design or product or project you can invest your creative energy into that and sort of um and share that unique fingerprint of who you are to the world that is the, the combination of our best creative work um and that's the end so I hope I talked fast enough to get through my usual one and a half hour lecture. Um, here's my details. I'd like to encourage people to um, you know, follow me on Twitter and Instagram. I'm posting stuff about environmental psychology and design all the time. And also my podcast, How to Save the World, my book has um, more in there. So thank you. Yeah, Katie, you did a nice job like squishing an hour and a half down into that <laughs> small timeline. There was one question that I saw, which was um, the name of the architect that you mentioned. Uh, I'll write it in. It's Vincent um, Calibor. Thank you. It's sort of it's well, a you're French. doing that. He's, he's French, so um, it's a little bit hard to say his name right because I'm not French, so I can't say it. <laughs> got it. Well, th thanks, Katie. I'm gonna. Um, but yeah, he's got an amazing these. website with all this and a great Instagram with it all there. Great. Um, I'll turn it over to Lisa for a, a quick introduction to what she's doing, and then we'll dive into the questions. Hi, thank you, Eric. Okay, let me share my screen real quick. I'm going to uh, do a much shorter introduction. <laughs> um, okay, you can see that okay. There we go. Okay, um, conscious communication design is kind of the... Uh, the nonprofit brand that I use in order to communicate my research. I do consider myself primarily as a, a design researcher. As Eric mentioned, I'm based in, uh, in Dublin, in Ireland. Uh, so it's just half past seven here. <laughs> Anyone else from Europe? Not sure. Okay. Um, so uh, as a design researcher, I've kind of, yeah, try to figure out how communication design, the, the profession itself, can be uh, done in a sustainable way. And that's what I've been doing for the last six years or so. And I'm only now kind of starting to communicate all this simply because I've been too shy really to, to talk about it or haven't fe felt adequate for it. Um, anyways, so uh, I am an educator as well. Uh, I lecture at uh, Griffith College in Dublin. Um, I teach a wide range of design modules, uh, nothing really relating to sustainability, but I obviously bring it into all of my subjects as well. So for example, when I'm, and I'm sure we're gonna talk about that in the in, in question uh, later. Um, but when I teach software, for example, I'm a big advocate for sustainable um, behavior with, uh, with data as well. And I think that's very, very important. Um, especially now that you know everything's moved uh, in the digital realm. 
Um, but yeah, I bring sustainability in there uh, everywhere, but I've also designed my own course. I'm going to get to that in a second. Um, I have just started my own podcast as well, uh, Conscious Communication Design, which you find on all, you know, wherever you listen to podcasts. It's only one episode out so far, but there's going to be weekly episodes um, that are aimed to be very, very practical because I find that is in the area of communication design, graphic design, very important because it is so abstract um, because we don't really see our material outcome as much as a fashion designer, for example, or a interior designer, where you can literally look at materials and supply chains and it's, you know, a bit more easy to see, uh, whereas in communication design, it's a bit less tangible, I suppose. And I work as a learning technologist as well. Um, so again, I just try to bring in, you know, my, my interest in uh, sustainable use of technology. Okay, so my research so far um, is that I would would say myself, uh, see myself as an academic uh, or researcher. I've written three master's theses on this topic so far. <laughs> the first one was, uh, I was trying to figure out how sustainably um, designers work in Ireland. Uh, I just moved here, I'm from Germany originally, and I wanted to kind of scope uh, everything and also did like an extensive lit review. Um, and then I did a master's in environmental sciences because I, I didn't feel like I, as a designer, could judge what sustainability means. And of course we can, but I wanted to, to, to really know <laughs> and really know in depth and be able to do a life cycle assessment, for example. And in the third one that I just finished um, a couple of weeks ago, actually, um, I did a master's in teaching education. Uh, which my workplace, my college kind of supports uh, all lecturers to do that. Um, but I designed, I did, a, did one by practice and I basically designed my own course because I realized that there is no course for what I want to teach <laughs> out there. So I just designed that course and I wanted to just briefly share that with you. I've actually made a PDF out of those slides and I'm going to put those in the chat in a minute because I would want all of this. This is basically the content of my course that I designed. And in case there is any graphic or communication design educators in here, I would love your feedback on this or maybe use this. I want this to be open source and many people profiting from it because we can't move fast enough with bringing sustainability into education and into design. So it's three modules. Um, one is on ethical and sustainable business practice. The second is on sustainable print and packaging design. And the third is sustainable digital and web design. Um, yeah, don't have to go into that too much now. Um, just to answer briefly what conscious or sustainable design is for me, it's mostly being aware of the responsibility that we have as designers because we are literally either producing something or as communication designers, uh, our job is to influence people. And that is a very, very big responsibility that I think we should be aware of that not only how we communicate, uh, but what we communicate as well, we're responsible for this. And I think we should be aware of that. And as educators, obviously, you know, there's this added bit of uh, responsibility that we need to take care of our students and make sure that we're future-proofing their careers as well. And I think for that, it's really necessary that we bring sustainability in because there's not sure about uh, wherever you guys, if you're all in the States, uh, in, in the EU, um, we have some big legislative change coming up. And I think it's going to be very important that not just corporations, but that everybody's kind of aware of what's happening there. Um, and generally, for me, conscious or sustainable design means designing for people, considering accessibility and diversity, respecting different cultures, and also giving back and making that part of our business, basically, that we give back as well. Uh, respecting resources. In my opinion, there's no such thing as waste, uh, not in the material world. I do think there's waste in the digital world. Um, and then when it comes to profit, that's it's always part of it. We always have to uh, have a profitable business, but there's amazing accreditation and certification out there. And if there isn't, that's what we can do. That's what we can, we can try to create that if we, if we define if we figure out there's a need for something and it's not there yet, then we have a clear goal. Um, because I guess I'm all about making what we're already experts in sustainable. So rather than um, adding 
to that and and, and uh, maybe in in a in a hobby sense kind of uh, trying to reduce our consumption or trying to change what we do i think that everybody no matter what job we have we need to make that job sustainable and that's kind of what i'm most passionate about to tell people that no matter what job you have if you work in an office especially in an office there's so much you can do um, but everybody knows best about their own job so rather than have someone external come in like a sustainability expert that's trying you know a third party trying to make your job sustainable i don't think that can really work i think we can do it from bottom up you know um yeah always reflect measure reassess communicate and collaborate that's what i learned anyways is that uh nobody can do it alone we always have to collaborate as much as we can um what's next for me um I am with the certificate uh, that I designed, I'm looking to propose that to my college that I'm working in, but I'm trying to, I want to create an online version of that as well so that it's accessible um, for globally for as, as many people as possible, because especially in sustainable digital design, there's very, very few resources out there. And it's so, so, you know, urgent that we take care of our digital resources as well and not transfer a wasteful behavior into the digital world. So I want to get my content out there um, as soon as I can. I'm starting doing wor workshops as well that are not just design related, but I'm doing them with general any corporation um, or students as well and teaching them how they can um, best like work with their digital resources. So avoiding digital wastefulness basically. And I really want to set up a conference as well um, if anyone wants to help me on that, because I've never organized an event, <laughs> so I don't know, but I would love to set that up because I think it's uh, it's time for that. Um, I think that's it. Cool. So um, that's how you can stay in touch with me. As I said, do please follow the podcast. I haven't really, you know, advertised it anywhere yet um, because I wanted to get a few more episodes out, but you can uh, press the follow button already. And then I'm on Twitter and Instagram as well. Uh, LinkedIn email do contact me if you want to get in touch and I'm going to share those slides now oh yeah and I put together this slide <laughs> which is a very small font um, but basically just copied all of the amazing books that I've encountered over the years and websites they're basically in the reading list of the course that I designed as well so if any of you are communication design or graphic design educators you might want to have a look at those I don't think it's too relevant for other design educators, but um, yeah, I'm going to share those slides now and then, I don't know, that's me. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Lisa. Um, yeah, the panel that um, is here today, uh, very different approaches, right? Um, but what is common and why I was an advocate for both Lisa and Katie here is that they're both very passionate and their approaches are practical, like they're, they're trying to do this in a way that can be done and not high level only or not very theoretical only. And sometimes as educators, we can start to drift that way. So we, I do hope that the, the discussion today, which is next, uh, provides you with very practical ways forward. So um, I don't know everyone's uh, level of knowledge of, of current climate trends and climate science. So I'm asking Lisa and Katie to comment on uh, the, the question of why is it so important now uh, more than ever to, for us design educators to be including climate science as part of our design curriculum, even foundationally from a sustainability level, uh, and not just from a teaching perspective, but from a design practice perspective. And then I want you to, to think about too is, what are the roadblocks? Why, why isn't this happening? So I'll turn it over to both Lisa and Katie here and feel free to jump in um, and with that question, a set of questions. And if you're in the audience, feel free to um, write things in, in the chat. Lisa or Katie? I'm just gonna jump on that, Katie, and you can add to that later. Um, why we need to... Uh, bring sustainability into our practice i think that was your first question um, practice and, teaching, yeah. and teaching yeah 
both really <laughs> is, is the same answer. I think um, we have really high goals uh, in, in reducing global warming uh, or hmm, reducing our negative impact, I suppose. Uh, if we want to keep our 1.5 degree goal, I'm not sure if you in the States actually uh, actually call it that 1.5 degree. We do in Europe anyways. Yeah. You do as well? Good. <laughs> Wasn't sure because of Fahrenheit. But um, yeah, if we want yeah. to keep that goal, um, we have to really do everything. We have to pull all the strings now. Uh, and I think each of us uh, as an individual and on a professional side as well. And I always find, I think what made me go into this direction is that I always saw uh, tips on how you can reduce your own impact. You know, you can recycle, you can, you know, stop wasting water and stuff. But that's just me. It's such a little impact. Um, and I think a lot of people feel that way. And of course, I do that as well. But I find in my job, I have much bigger impact in what I can do. And I kind of have so much impact. So whatever our job is, and as a designer, especially, as I said, we have so much responsibility. Uh, and we make design decisions all day long and each decision can be can be directed in a certain way that it's you know having less negative impact and then as an educator of course I want to transfer this mindset onto students as well uh, and, and making it clear that this is the norm and that's why I still love that I'm not teaching what I I'm not teaching sustainable design just yet uh, but teaching just general design modules and that way I can make it normalize it for all of my students um, what sustainable practice is. Yeah, that's an interesting point too, because a lot of us here are, might be very passionate about what we're discussing today, but you know, are not teaching this um, in our classes. And, and I, like the, I like the analogy, the soup analogy, where um, I want to give kids the soup, but I can't. So I got to sprinkle some vegetables mm -hmm. throughout the different classes so they get um, that information very foundational. Uh, Katie, what, what are your thoughts about, about that? The question? Yeah, it was a asked. difficult question. So I'm really glad that I've gone second because now I could have a little bit of time to, <laughs> time to, um, to uh, think about it. I mean, I've come from a little bit of a different background coming, you know, hanging out with engineers and scientists, engineers and scientists who are terrible at design, usually terrible at, at communication, um, and not very creative and wouldn't even, even if they tried, they, they couldn't be. And these are the people who have been in charge of trying to roll out these change, uh, these change campaigns. And so what you've had happening is, um, let's suppose to put people in silos, you've got the engineers and the scientists in one silo, then you've got, let's say, we'll put creative people all in one silo, filmmakers, comics, artists, graphic designers, the people who are able to make beautiful, captivating things, they're all in one, they're in another bucket over here. Um, and then you've got the behavioral scientists. These are the psychologists who study the research about what actually gets people to change. You know, they really look deeply. They spend their lives doing papers and studies and what gets people to act. And seriously, these three groups do not communicate with each other hardly at all like and so the fact that there's a silo of this going on is just a tragedy and we need to everybody needs to cross pollinate more when you say why do we need to have more um design climate in design education i mean if those three groups are, um, are working together and then you've got all the computer science people the programmers and the technology people at google like seriously the cross pollination is not happening hardly at all it needs to happen everybody's got to be hanging out together and sharing knowledge because that's where innovation happens when two new fields come together that haven't come together um before um, and also, what I just wanted to mention something that you said earlier, Eric, where you said oh, our work is practical, it's not so much in the design theory. Um, it is very practical, like how to get things done, but um, it's very rooted in a, in a deep theoretical basis. Like all the ideas that I have and the work I've done now and the thinking that I'm doing, I read in academic journals that has been written by people that have PhDs and it's really quite deeply theoretical. So it might look like I just designed this little light with an earth face on it. So it's like a little red light. And I got FIMO. Art people here probably all know what FIMO is, like little modeling clay. And then I made a little face on it with eyes. And it glows. And it looks just like a cute 
craft project that I would have done with my child, right? But there's like, there's deep stuff in here. One, it uses color, it uses automatic feedback loops um, of, of data. It uses color, which I've read studies on and I've interviewed the main author who researches this. Um, it's very powerful. It's you know this part of this ambient theory. Um, it uses like a charismatic face. So you we learned that in my presentation I just did. And it uses eyes. There's one study that shows that when you show a picture of eyes watching people, it motivates people to do the right thing, like to put money in an honesty box. And it can also help people motivate people to use, um, you know, less electricity. So I'm drawn from this deep theoretical research to come up with something that's very practical. Okay, like put the earth light on and earth light's going to get you to like, use the microwave instead of the oven during the peak time. So to do really, I think, good climate design, you need to be versed in all of this academic research, all these tools of the trade of behavioral psychology, which unfortunately gets stuck with, like it gets stuck in academic people. The only people I know who really understand environmental psychology are people who have done a PhD in environmental psychology. Like literally, like I have never met a single person in the field who knows this stuff, who is not, doing like postgraduate research like it's the worst if there was a bubble of bubble of bubbles it is the most bubbly mm. bubble um ever um and uh and i just think particularly with a, like a design community i mean you can think about it in two different ways like often when people are talking about sustainable design they're talking about a particular product like they're talking about like a handbag or a garment or a bottle or a box right and they're looking at basically the life cycle analysis and the purpose of this item what there's a whole other type of design which is something i'm more interested in which is how you actually facilitate the the behavior because you can only go so far with a product you've got to really look at the ultimate flow the whole system of basically how people are using products through their whole lives and looking at how you would design the system, like how you would design, you know, a prompt, like how would you design um, like a, something that sits on your fridge and prompts you to open the fridge less or to remind you that next time you go to the shop, you know, we're not buying these particular types of products or we do want to buy these other types of products. Or if you're looking at, I mean, who cares if the, the product that you make or the garment that you make is all, you know, eco-friendly, it eventually, gets holes in it and you have to throw it out. So what is the life cycle of, there's so much, what I'm trying to say is there's so much design work to be done around the recycling portion of the garments and hardly anybody is working on that. There's all these garments, eco-friendly or not, which get thrown out. Like the, um, the, the third largest portion of landfill is textiles. First is um, compostable waste, food and uh, grass. The second one is construction waste. And the third one is textiles. So it's actually not plastic. Like that's a whole system that needs to be designed around behaviors, you know? So we don't just look at like the product, look at the entire stream. And that's just such a, a ripe area for people who are great graphic artists to be looking into this psychology, looking into this sort of behavioral flow and doing something really creative there because all of the people who are in charge of sustainability, the engineers and scientists can't do it. So really, really need, um, really need your, uh, your help. Um, so anyway, that's a bit of a rambly long answer of my notes. So um, I'm just going to stop there. So, <laughs> and that's fine. That's fine. I, I have kind of a script here, but I have dozens more questions leading off from both what, what both you uh, said in your answers. So I'm just going to ask those anyways, because uh, it, it seems like uh, I'm hearing from both of you that there's a lot of moving parts in the idea of systems. Everything is connected, but they're not talking to each other and you end up creating the, the same mess over and over and over again. And in academia, of course, you have these silos and even in, in, in the corporate world too, where they're not communicating. So maybe my question is, how do we, how do we stop that? How do we get people to communicate um, more about this so that we can make effective solutions? Obviously that's a tough question too. Uh, so maybe looking at it th from the perspective of a designer, how can a designer be a part of, out of that um, type of solution? Well, and, I mean, I don't know, yeah. but maybe we just need to have like a big party and just get one person from each, a climate scientist, a graphic designer, a game designer, like a deep technologist, computer programmer, um, and a psychologist, and then just put them together with a challenge and then see what happens. <laughs> Yeah, I like the idea of the Manhattan Project for good um, with a lot more people involved than just scientists could be could be a way to do that. 
Lisa, did I wonder you have if they thoughts? get along or they'd all start arguing with each other. That's a very possible <laughs> you know, outcome to that. Yeah, <laughs> egos get in the way. Um, I, it's not really the solution, <laughs> but um, I think it, what I discovered for myself when I when I started thinking about uh, how how can I make this job um, a sustainable one is that I started. Um, sneaking into other realms and I try to encourage as many people you know to do the same so for example um I tried to work very briefly but it was difficult <laughs> but uh, to work in uh, in printing so I managed to get a job in printing I was fired after two months but uh, I learned a lot and that was literally my goal um and then I uh, worked in paper technology as well and I worked in IT briefly as well and that way I kind of like gathered a lot of information so now I'm obviously not recommending to get jobs in order to get fired just to learn from them but um <laughs> I do also go to a lot of meetings and conferences that aren't designed for people like me necessarily so um just recently uh, we had some amazing conferences on um sustainability in the ict sector for example and i just went in there introduced myself made some amazing connections and that way i think <laughs> basically what i'm trying to say is i believe that the way we have set up our industries that each kind of stays their own i think that's gonna that's a thing of has to be a thing of the past i don't think that's a sustainable way of looking at professions and industries and um, especially in design we see that so dominantly that it's not just one job it's all fluid like who works as a just graphic designer do you know, like most people work as UX UI designer or they work as a mm -hmm. web designer as well, or they work as, don't know, there's so many, it's so interchangeable and it's so fluid. That's why we can't really look at industries like that anymore. And I hate that most conferences, that's still how we communicate most of this stuff. They're, they're too one-sided, you know? And we that's why I try to sneak in as into as many as I can and just take what I what I can get from them. But I would love if more people did that, that we try to, you know, open everything up and uh, invite to our own conferences as well, invite people that aren't necessarily working in that sector because it's just, yeah, sectors don't really work for me anyways. <laughs> so we need more uh, infiltration and other yes. worlds as well as them and ours. Katie, do you find that in, in the engineering and environmental science worlds that you're a part of? Do you see that interest in sharing knowledge or, or not? Oh yeah, I think people are all very, I mean, it's a, got a very lovely kind of personality type, you know, is attracted to it, not necessarily like a creative type, but everybody is quite, um, you know, open and, and nice. But everybody's sort of fixated on their, um, you know, the discipline. People have studied engineering, they've studied science. It's kind of like the way they, the way they think, and it's quite foreign for them to think in a different way. Um, but I'm just so passionate about this, this topic of like getting out of your field and learning um, new things. There's, I just interviewed on my podcast a, um, a Jesse Shell. He's the author of a, the kind of canonical game design textbook, The Art of Game Design. He's a professor at Carnegie Mellon University, and he has this story in his book. If anyone wants to read his book, it's just called The Art of Game Design. It's this big textbook. Book. and the story about how he was juggling and he used to like juggle as a teenager and then he found there was this other juggling guy who was like really um wild he did like all this stuff that none of the other jugglers could do and then he just tells the story about how he doesn't like copy other jugglers he says I don't copy anyone in my field everybody else copies every everyone he goes I go out and I look for inspiration everywhere else and I, I wrote about it in, in my book I did a, a podcast I've had all these videos about it it's just such an amazing story of how he became like the best of all the jugglers by not copying people and that's what we do when we're in silos we all copy everybody else we're like oh what fonts is everybody using I'm just going to do that or um my child's just yelling at me um i think we've got to really like uh watch ourselves of this tendency to copy others and then look to other professions yeah um you both also um mentioned something which led me to a question um that i wanted to also open up to everyone here that's in attendance and that question is um not not all of us are as well versed in um, climate science sustainability as our 
um, two panelists here. So, you know, what do you think um, then our biggest needs as design educators are to, to get ourselves to a level where we can be um, talking about this more confidently with more details, with more actionable things in the classroom, for instance, like using game design as a way uh, to change behaviors. And, and I'll open this up, um, not just to, to Lisa and Katie, but to everyone, what do we need to, to get ourselves up to a level where we're you know, educating the educators essentially to be um, climate design educators? And it looks like Katie, Katie's back. Okay, good. Um, but Lisa, maybe you can um, start with that. And, and if anyone uh, wants to add in in the chat, that would be great. How we can educate designers, uh, educators. That's basically the question, isn't it? Basically. Tough one. <laughs> I think we need to get out of our silos, right? We've heard, but what are the yeah. things? have you uh, felt along your way yeah good one um i thought i could tackle that well i i would encourage everybody not to be like me and wait uh, six years until they finally <laughs> get there because as katie mentioned as well there's a lot of people in academia that kind of do amazing interesting research but then it never gets anywhere um and i think we need to talk about it even if we aren't experts that's because nobody is just because I specialize in this area doesn't mean I know everything. I can't, it's impossible. And it's also impossible to be completely sustainable in the first place. Like, you know, we have to see it as something fluid, intangible, but we still need to like talk about it and, and do our best. And um, that's probably the, the, the best way to go about it. Um, yeah. What other well, tips do I have? <laughs> I see in the chat, there is something about uh, feeling stuck, you know, that they don't know enough um, about teaching this topic. And one thing that I thought was useful for me was I actually trained with uh, Al Gore's Climate Re Reality Project. And uh, there's a lot of details there. Some of them are uh, very uh, doom and gloom, which Katie said we should avoid. But then there are some very practical things there. And one of them was just a simple fact that manufacturing is, if not the largest, one of the largest contributors to um, our, our climate crisis and around 80% of the environmental damage that comes from any sort of uh, project where something is then manufactured is in the design phase. And that's a huge important fact that we can share with our students as well as, hey, if you're an educator, you might wanna sign up for the climate reality training, it's free. Um, so Katie, um, one the question I was asking here a minute ago, because you had to step away was, um, what do you think? Um, what do you think uh, uh, design educators need uh, if they if they're not at the level to feel confident about talking about this in the classroom? What what kind of assistance um, can you give to those educators that feel that way? Well, I just think like I mean, if you're trying to do any type of climate design, I just don't think you can just get a leg in unless you've got like the basic behavioral psychology stuff down. So, I mean, it's, it's not a very like well taught subject. I mean, when it comes to environmental specifics, so there's a lot of books, there's like the book Nudge and the book Influence. And there's a great textbook called, I think it's called like behavior design, behavior change design. But mm -hmm. when you're coming to environment, it it's quite different because we've got this whole like sort of it's called biospheric values like how we connect with the planet and how we kind of influence social change and movement so it's got all these dynamics that traditional behavioral psychology doesn't have um so i think just you know just it would be good if there was a basic pro forma course like there was just like a pdf i mean my book is kind of like a proxy for that but you know if there were an academic person could come up with their own like just looking at like what social norms are you know social comparison feedback loops um you know the reward system of the brain um you know how people create groups you know just like the basic stuff so you don't get designers going out and just making mistakes i mean they make mistakes all the time i've got one in my book which is a simple mistake that gets made constantly um and i think everybody makes it until they know otherwise which is when you tell people the bad thing that's going on you you explain the negative social norm which is like everybody's littering and then you put a picture of litter and then what that does is people will imitate that they'll actually litter more because they're like well everyone's littering you know who, who cares 
what you all look everybody's using lots of plastic bottles uh, so uh you think oh yeah well you know you read it and your unconscious mind can't help but imitate well everyone's using plastic bottles i'll use plastic bottles too instead of framing the the text saying that you know like an increasing number of people are using reusable bottles please buy the reusable bottle and a picture of the person using the reusable bottle like just that basic like it's just so obvious when you read about it but if someone maybe didn't ever tell you and you didn't read you know you wouldn't know so just like this basic behavioral science and um and just kind of like what i mentioned before when you talk about like the manufacturing industry like if your job as a designer is to just make a disposable plastic bottle i don't know slightly less polluting like okay cool maybe i remember they i saw one they had like a little cap so they, they decreased the cap size so instead of like a big cap now it's like a little cap and they're like we saved all this plastic and all of these creatures from dying because our plastic cap is now half the size that it was it's like well I suppose it's a move in the right direction but ultimately if you really want to be a powerful designer you want to be looking at how to put reusable bottle infrastructure into the world like how do we have it in parks how do we have it in lobbies in gyms so instead of like the vending machine where you get all the plastic bottles like what are we going to be designing i mean that's where you want to have your imagination in not imagination in not just the single product so and they're the kind of like two things i think design educators could enhance their curriculum in yeah just i think add something there oh, sorry yeah. eric <laughs> <laughs> um just uh, uh while katie was uh, talking i was thinking um if i had to break down everything i learned about sustainable design into i can basically break all of it down into just two things um that we need to know one would be ethics and i think that's a really good uh, way to start um for any project so rather than i would never say to my students uh, we, we need to create and um, or, or would never unless it's in the brief, but you know, like as in it has to be like uh, environmentally sustainable, but rather let them figure out what's important to them. I find those, uh, those briefs the most valuable lesson most of the time that I let them figure out what's important to them, uh, figure out their own values. What do they believe in? What's important to them? And that could be, you know, societal issues or environmental ones. And then they build their project around that, figuring out, the problem that they want to solve themselves. So that's something we can all integrate into briefs and into the cur curriculum quite easily because it doesn't have to be very, it's defined on the students' own values so they have to figure it out themselves. And a lot of them are probably gonna say, I care for environmental stuff anyways. So it's gonna be an environmental project. And then the second thing is, um, I think all we need to know about sustainability is the life cycle of whatever we're designing, producing, and considering each and every part of that and asking questions about it. That's really all it is. That's all there is to know that we need to ask ourselves in each stage of the product. So if I'm designing a print product that's more tangible, you know, I'm looking at paper and ink and uh, the computer that I use to design and where is the product going in the end or in a digital product, I have the same thing. I'm using resources and I put it, uh, the data on a server. So there's, there's things involved, there's steps involved. In the end, it's one life cycle though. So within that one life cycle, I'm looking at the individual points and, where does it come from? What resources did it take? And where does it go afterwards? And that's all we can ever do. So it's all about asking questions for the whole chain, for the whole cycle of the product. I think that's all there is to know in the end. Well, so it can I'm, be quite easy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it sounds, it sounds easy the way you put it. Uh, as, as also the, uh, I said in the beginning, as I'm also kind of a panelist here, I'll, I'll add in my two cents to that question. In case it does help, I think something I learned with doing a lot of community based work was to seek wise counsel. And so um, if I wanted to teach something but didn't know enough, I would invite someone who did know into the classroom. So I've brought in uh, two climate scientists over the years when I was working on projects that did involve behavioral change, right? And they didn't know, like as Katie illuminated before how to create behavioral change, but they did provide the facts, right? They helped me teach the students about what's the situation, right? And, you know, one of my students even asked like, so is climate 
is the climate crisis going to be something that we have to worry about? And I could see him roll his eyes and say, basically, the, the job's not getting done from the academic paper standpoint to communicate to the general public, this is something that needs to be acted on now. So bring, bring important um, experts into the classroom, uh, that helps. And I think the other thing, someone actually put it in the chat, which is great, which was, you know, designers have clients or stakeholders in what they do and just put as a parameter for your project, earth is a stakeholder you know, who speaks for the air and who speaks for the water and who speaks for the land? Well, if, if uh, no one's doing it, we have to do it. And so if that's a parameter for your project, it's gonna force uh, you as the educator to start um, doing some more homework on like what Lisa said, what's the life cycle impacts of, of these things. Um, so it's getting up until we have 30 minutes left. And so oh, I'm- Can I say something yeah. else about that? Go ahead, yeah, definitely. Oh, one thing that I find that people ask um, me, it's a, it's a little bit tangential, but I think it's a really interesting thing to think of. It's more in terms of how people are at in their careers working commercially. And so people, they're like budding designers and they're looking for work, you know, and often like your job will dictate what you have to do. So the designer may not have much freedom to do kind of interesting things that they want to do. And so they'll say to me, Katie, how do you get to work on these interesting projects and do this thing? And I say, well, 95% of what I do, I actually don't get paid for. And I'm just coming up with ideas constantly and putting them out into the world. So I have kind of tangentially came into this space by just, reading all the behavioral psychology which was really interesting it gave me a whole bunch of ideas I started putting them into photoshop because I was like these ideas are cool I'm just gonna like put it in photoshop and then mock it up and then I had more and more and I was like gee I better put a page on my website to put all these ideas on and then there was like 30 or 40 of them you know I'm like this is actually really fun and people share them a lot on social media so I just kept on mocking up ideas constantly some of them are kind of out there and they may never really happen you know like magic leap for the whole biophilic city I mean that's a pretty out there expensive project if it was ever going to happen but then as I put these out there people start actually like connecting with them and then somebody will call me and they'll be like oh Katie we're doing a gamification project for something green and we saw your thing you know could we pay you to do basically good money to do like a dream job with great people and so I don't think you need to follow the career, the, the conventional career path that is a designer. You don't need to just like get a regular job, be told exactly what to do. Um, you can like totally carve out your own path. Like I call myself a Fitbit for the planet designer. It literally does not exist as a profession. I'm just sort of like making it up as I go. You can just put out great work, market yourself, network a lot invent your own niche and then eventually somebody will pay you to do it like I promise you eventually if you keep on it and network enough someone will pay you to do it you don't need to let the industry and the market define who you are and what you do just be bold and just come up with your own ideas and carve your own way develop your own identity and your own style yeah I think that's another really important point about you know even what you tell your design students is your career doesn't have to be what you are just told or maybe um, you foresee it could be as you go into design school, it could be so many other things. And so I think inviting both Lisa and Patrick, uh, sorry, Katie Patrick into your classrooms would be a fantastic idea for the fall because I think they would be a great, um, ins great inspiration for your students. Uh, so like I said, we're coming into about 30 minutes left here and, and um, I'm all for, anyone turning off their mic and, and asking a question to all of us as a group and of course the panelists. Um, so if anyone does have a burning question that they didn't get answered in the chat, which I don't think we've answered most of those, just unmute yourself and we'll uh, be happy to meet you. I have, I, I have a question about tracking tracking all these parameters when it comes to companies. And a few months ago, I read a very interesting article about a reporter who was trying to track down the supply chain that Amazon uses to make their batteries. And the whole article went into how, you know, how contaminating making batteries is, but how companies are fighting at, at all lengths. You know, the, the article covered all the money that was being poured in to hide who these suppliers were. The reporter eventually found out, you know, in the factories, all this, like all this waste was being generated. It was like the, 
And, and I'm wondering what, what is, if, do you have any good tip as to how do you suggest we begin to understand how to better track these? Because, you know, the, the supply chains of these companies, for me, you know, it, it takes a long time to understand how these things work. And then, of course, they go into all these tangential, all these naming conventions that become very businessy. And then we get lost. I mean, and I bet that they're doing it on purpose so that we never find out. But it, it's, sure. it, it, it's all of you have spoken today about transparency and data and a lot of what you're doing uses this data to make the world better. But I am struggling to try to understand how to get to that data so that I can make better choices. Well, I can say real quick that you made a comment that maybe they don't want you to know. And I think that's accurate. And for an example, I signed a project a number of years ago, which was um, for the students to, it was like a potluck. All the students brought their favorite dish and they had to make it themselves or if if it was cereal, they could bring the cereal. And, and uh, then afterwards, after we talked about it, I asked them to, to look at the supply chain and then the carbon footprint of the food they just ate, right? And it kind of was a shock to them that all of a sudden they had to do some work. They thought it was just a fun little potluck. But in the end, they had to, like you did, Alberto, and your students did, they had to call like investigative journalists, you know, General Mills, uh, companies that manufactured the pasta that they love uh, to figure out, you know, where are they getting their gluten-free pasta from or flour from, for example. And it was like hidden behind door after door after door of information until finally a few of them found out it was coming from India. And it's like, okay, well, um, I'm in Illinois and Kansas is just down the road, like, or Nebraska is just down the road, like what happened there? So um, it, everything is this large system, you know, and that's how nature works. It's, it works in this interconnected set of systems uh, that ebbs and flows and what goes in, something comes out, right? And you want to balance in that system. And so um, that's when we're thinking about um, sustainability, we're thinking about balancing that particular system. So uh, I think your question is a great one. And I think it's a really challenging thing to answer because some of the doors are closed and they don't want to let you in to see, but then you know, like, listen, I'm not going to spend my money here. <laughs> if you're not going to be transparent about it and a lot of the younger generations and some of us as well are, we wanna know transparently where things come from. But I'll, I'll stop there and let someone else uh, come in on this. Oh, can I jump in? Because it's an area I'm really, I know about. Yeah. Um, if you really want to take a deep dive, there's a book called, um, a book called uh, Disclosure. Now I kind of remember the title of it. Oh my God. Um, no, it's called Disclosure. It's called Disclosure. No, the trials and the trials and something of disclosure. Um, and there's a guy who studies it called Akon Fung at Harvard University. And so there's this field called mandatory disclosure because often when we're wanting to get data out there, not everybody will want the data out. The good players want, they want to be like, yeah, look how great we are. But then the bad players are not going to want to have it. So what you need is the government getting in there and mandating that the data is, um, is made public. It's really the only way to get a unanimous data set. However, the bright side for that is that Industry doesn't really like being told what to do. Often industry doesn't like the EPA and they don't like environmental regulations. So you say, listen, we're not gonna regulate that heavily. We just wanna see the data. So they'll agree to the mandatory disclosure of data kind of as a trade-off when they won't wanna to agree to, you know, like really severe environmental restrictions. So these mandatory disclosure laws have been quite easy to get through, but they can have just as good effect because once you've got the mandatory disclosure, you can put everyone out like on a leaderboard and you can basically be like, well, why are you in the bottom five percentile of like really bad performers? All, everybody will wanna improve their score. And the EPA did this with toxic chemicals and they actually got, it was one of the biggest environmental wins of history that like hardly anybody knows about unless you like really work in the space. But they got a 45% reduction in toxic chemical use in America because the EPA put in this mandatory disclosure. And they didn't tell anyone they used to have to stop using toxic chemicals. It was just by looking at the data, they actually changed that. Um, so I think it is really difficult often to get the data. And I think your example was um, really cool that you mentioned Eric with the, the cereal and the pasta. Um, it was such a fun idea. 
uh, calling companies, you know what? And if they don't know the answer, who knows how far it will go up to the top. I mean, you hear when companies talk about like changes they make, they're like, somebody wrote me a letter, you know? It's like, I don't know if it takes like that many people writing letters to make this change because often it doesn't, it doesn't seem to take that much. Um, and you could actually have like a really big effect. And like with the batteries, um, if you actually start asking questions, you know, maybe it could actually make a, bit, a bigger change um, than you think. But I mean, if anyone wants to work on it, you know, it, it all comes under that umbrella of mandatory disclosure. And there's been a lot of case studies and research done on it, how it affects things. Um, if you love to read academic policy papers for fun. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I'm just going to jump in there if that's okay. Um, there's two resources that I wanted to share with you guys as well. Um, one is, I'll put that in the chat now. Um, I asked recently in an interview with uh, Tom Greenwood, who is um, the founder of Whole Grain Digital. It's just a, a very, very progressive, uh, sustainable web design studio in, in London. I asked him, how do you even... How did you go about assessing your your carbon footprint and in order to reduce it? And he was like, eh, well, so we didn't do it ourselves. <laughs> there is companies who do that for you. Um, one of them is uh, Plan A. I'm sure there is American versions of this out there, but they basically use AI in order to assess the the data that they I don't really know how they gather the data, <laughs> but I think it is painstakingly questioning uh, all the employees uh, about uh, you know what they do um and then another resource i wanted to share i just thought it's it's really interesting they don't really discuss everything on their website um but i think their approach is really interesting and i think um, we're going to see a lot more of that i'm just hoping that these assessing companies are going to be you know transparent with how they do that as well because that's the only way it works um another great resource i found um by Ad Green, uh, also British based, but uh, anyways, they have an amazing resources guide. It's like a PDF that is very up to date kind of questions that you can ask yourselves in in terms of it's more advertising production. It's not my area so much, but it's a really really interesting just the way they ask the questions in there. And um, so looking at all individual like factors that uh, lead to you know a sustainable corporation really um or business practice the way they ask questions in that guide is really nice and can be transferred to whatever other area as well i think so um i encourage you to have a look at that thanks both of you are there any are there any other questions from from the audience I have a quick question. Um, well, first I should say thank you all for all your hard work and research um, and information in this area. It's really helpful and useful. It's something that I am increasingly uh, interested in exploring um, and my students um, seem to be in the same category. So um, my first real exposure to sustainability was through working in a lead platinum office um, within an architecture firm. And it really changed the way I think about sustainable design as a whole. And then as I began teaching, I said, well, how can I share that experience with my students? Sadly on my campus, we don't have a single solar panel. Um, so I decided to bring them to a lead platinum building just to expose them. And it was phenomenal. Um, and so the bigger question is really, I think around um, the connection between communication design and sustainable architecture. Like, you know, unfortunately, I feel like um, in many cases, there's a disconnect there because we're not teaching environmental design, uh, you know, as much as we used to in these programs. So I just wonder if there's any other thoughts, if anybody's had similar experiences. And I mentioned in the chat, this idea of like lead accreditation for communication designers or something like that. So yeah, that's actually a really good question. And I, what I like about <coughs> LEED is that the tiers uh, in the, the different LEED um, up to platinum <clears throat> allow uh, architects to 
do better each time. And of course, like working with different clients, budget in the world um, definitely goes down sometimes, of course. So if, if designers thought in a similar way, maybe as educators or practitioners, we could think about <clears throat> doing better each time and setting these sort of levels or tiers similar to lead. I tried to do that on Renourish and I think it's still there, renourish.org. And, it, and it's helped, you know, um, it's an educational process as well as it's a way to um, <clears throat> increase uh, the sustainability of the projects as they go along. Yeah, no, I used to be a lead certifier person. It was my first job I, I had. And um, I'm not a fan of the, um, of the way that the Green Building Council has done it. Um, I think the, the lead system, it's called Green Star, it's called different things in different countries, is good as an overall design framework. Like if you want to learn how to design a more sustainable building, it gives you like all these like 25 different sort of things to look at. And then people go through their accreditation course and they learn more about it. That's good. But in terms of like a, a, a tool to actually decarbonize building stock, I actually think it's really weak in its design and it's by no means like the gold standard. It doesn't use a single tool in the behavioral change toolkit. It's like, and also the thing is with the industry is that it's all based on new buildings, like not all, but like most of the time it's working on whenever a new building gets done, what about the other like 99% of buildings that are already there? Right, um, so I'm a fan of using like um, the whole like disclosure idea that like every building needs to be like, have its data out, mandatory by the government. You cannot hide, maybe not for residential, but for commercial, you, you can't hide. If you've got a really bad building, it's gonna be out there on the street. Everybody can see it, it's got a little red light on it or whatever. Um, and all the buildings are ranked from best performing, you know, like carbon intensity per square foot, the best right down to the worst. And everyone's data is transparent. And that's the, the upward spiral that we need, the data there. Um, anyway, that's just my thoughts on the lead thing. But when you're trying to think about that as a proxy, you know, for designers, I mean, having some sort of like course that people can go through is neat. But um, I think we need to be really wary of this eco-label design because I don't think eco-labels have ever come through that those types that just give labels. I think we want to be looking at like data feeds not labels and because labels are only going to be like oh look here's the really nice five percent you know you want to have everybody's data even the worst ones because that's what drives everybody like as a, as a group so just because people have done eco labels in the past doesn't mean we need to copy them and i think it's not um i think eventually they, i think they will eventually all go extinct mm. Yeah, I think yeah, there was a project like that that um, was done in um, with 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 clothing, right? I thought there was um, a way that you could um, either use augmented reality on your phone or go to their website to see, you know, like Patagonia, for instance, how how they uh, source their clothing. Uh, Everlane is another one that does it. Um, so I think that that was one that I was really familiar with was in the world of fashion. And I feel like I interrupted somebody when I spoke. Was there someone else that wanted to say something? Oh, I was just gonna mention as a follow-up, of course, LEED is probably the most popular in the US um, system, but there are many. Um, and there's a lot of debate about mm -hmm. the, uh, you know, which system is the best. Um, you know, it seems like LEED tries to go for this idea of, something is better than nothing, um, you know, kind of generally, and they have a committee that co constantly updates the protocols each year. Um, and they are shifting from new buildings to reuse and stuff like that. Um, but there are other ones like the living building challenge, I, just to mention another one that I think is uh, much more innovative in getting buildings that are like, you know, fully sustainable and, and in many cases off the grid. Um, you know, here again, I think as communication designers, like where's our equivalent of the living building challenge, like in, in terms of the projects that we do. So, you know, sometimes I always thought like um, communication designers were ahead of folks like architects, you know, uh, in thinking about these things. But here, I, I actually think they are ahead of us to be qu quite honest. Um, and, um, you know, the, there's much more experimentation. And I think uh, there's plenty of room for us to do more here. So that, I, again, I think this panel is really um, 
uh, seeded with a lot of great ideas. Why don't you start it then? Start the living building challenge equivalent for <laughs> oh my designers. Gosh. Somebody's going great to start advice. it. Great yes. advice. I love it. Don't well, be afraid of failure. Try it. If it doesn't work, you know, you know, no one's going to have hard feelings. Only yeah. growth. Thank you for that. Um, <laughs> I'm going to put it on the list. Um, and Katie, you will be on the committee. Yeah, okay. I suppose I've dug my own grave there with that. Okay, I'll be on the committee. I got you. At least you got one friend, at least. And I'm sure lots of others. Who, anyone else should put their little hand thing up on Zoom if they want to be on the committee too. Well, actually, this this does lead into my like final question as in the last 10 minutes. A perfect transition. Thank you, Dan. Um, and that is we're here at an AIGA Design Educators uh, Conference, right? And um, I'm really curious about what you as a community want to come of this particular panel, right? We're talking about um, an issue, climate change, which has a great effect on everyone and, and even more so on, on others, depending. And is it, does it stop here? I hope not. Like, what do we want to come of this as a community, as a collective, and how can we help each other get, get there? So that's kind of my, my parting shot in the last 10 minutes. Living building challenge for designers will happen. So what else? <laughs> and you can use your mic for this one as well. Why don't you get somebody who's a, um, like do a session on the type of people I interview for my podcast, the, the environmental psychologists, because they're really, really smart. Um, and they know like so much more than us. And even I've just still, I'm still a beginner in the space, even though I specialize in it. Like they're like really advanced, kind of like the elders, you know, create a, mm -hmm. uh, get three of them and um, to, um, to come on and ask them these questions and they'll have really insightful stuff to say. I think that's a great idea because it also tackles another issue we raised earlier, which was working down the silos. Why is there always graphic designers or industrial designers on the same panel? Why aren't there the people that Katie mentioned here? And, and there is a great idea that's easily yeah. implementable. You probably yeah, need to go. I come, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, you need to go back to the fundamental system of acad the way academia is structured, that it doesn't incentivize anybody to get out their information to people that can implement it usefully. They just need to publish, publish, and stay quiet. Um, I mean, publicly quiet. So um, that fundamental structure is a constant disincentive for them to be out in conferences like this. True, true. Very true. Can you change that as you work in academia, Eric? Can you... You can spearhead um, that. I'm going to give everybody I'd jobs have, to do. <laughs> I'd have to go back to being an administrator, and I don't want to do that. But potentially from the ground up, I can I can continue to work. <laughs> a hack that. away at the ivory tower. <laughs> yeah. Uh, is it Elio? You have a question, comment. Yeah, I have a comment. Um, I think that one way to be more aware of them, not, not only climate change, anything that could be wasteful is when you go through a need and then you actually experience that, that lack of a resource, then I think you would have a better understanding of the situation. Um, that's on, on, on one hand, is, is that like trying to put yourself in the shoes of, other per, of, of whomever is going through that experience in order to really, really understand that. And I don't really know how to make that happen. It's like, okay, we have to be more aware about water waste. So I'm going to shut you know, your water supply and then you have to take a shower with a little cup as I have done it hmm. in, in, during times of, um, of drought, right? And there's nothing that you can do <laughs> or lack mm -hmm. of electricity because the shining path is taking the towers, you know, knocking them down and then the city goes completely black. And then you say, now I have to come up with a, a way. Of course, this, there are different reasons, but when you go through that experience, you may be able to be more aware of what to do. 
or to be wasteful. I mean, I made a silly comment on the on the, on the chat saying that I have never bought bottled water. I've never done it, and uh, whenever I'm tempted, I say, "No, I cannot break my record." So I continue, continue, continue. Right. <laughs> so, I think it's by making probably some uh, decisions about that. And then the second part would be about the collaboration and the working in groups. I find that also very challenging, not impossible. We talk a lot about that in my institution. We talk about collaboration a lot. It has become just this phrase. But when you want to make it happen, you encounter this, um, these difficulties and there are ways to make it, to make it, to make it work. It's just, you have to work much harder. So mm -hmm. then how do you really, um, I have this, uh, this project last, last semester in which students had to work together in order to create social media ads for Instagram to promote our programs. And man, they, they struggled, you know, working together and you give them all the information, but that's the thing they told me. Personally, he said, I don't want to be dragged down by somebody who is not going to be responsible as I am or things like that. So those are the yeah. challenges, you know? So sometimes we talk at least um, within, within some groups that we should be doing this and that and that and say, how can we make that happen? Those strategies are the ones that we need to discuss also a little bit more. Thank you. Yeah, sometimes we forget, you know, we have a great assignment and they work in groups and we forget group dynamics and to talk about the group dynamics and how to make that um, run smoother. I think we face that every time. <laughs> I know I have. So that's a really good point. Um, so uh, what, what else uh, comes to mind from, from uh, everyone here? Just think groups of where it's at. Everything I've been, my whole, um, what do you call it? Zeitgeist of the last six weeks for me has just been group, 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 thinking groups, which is a little bit hard with COVID, but just I've never in my whole life thought that everything has to be done via group psychology. And now I'm just totally in a different headspace about designing for groups. So, uh, you know, if you just tell people your design objective is to get groups of humans to influence each other through forming a group with a common goal, got a totally different framework to if you see people all as individual actors. Yeah, for sure. And, and I actually, my, the, the next episode of Climify, I talked to a climate scientist um, who mentions, which I think is very positive, that designers, in his view, are really good at piling on like new knowledge through the different clients they work with from different sectors, and that um, we always have to keep track of, you know, technology and how we make things and, and the supply chain of where things go. And so I think um, my takeaway from his conversation or his comments were that we can do this. We can add behavioral science into our repertoire. Um, takes work, working uphill, like Leo said, it's a lot of it's a challenge, but I think it's something we have to do. Um, I'm all in on it. And so I'm very open to um, working with any of you on, on things going forward in the fall and beyond on what I want to come out of this conversation is just more conversation and more action because there's really not a lot of time to waste on this. And I find myself every day like, oh, I don't want to go and do this. But I know like the, the clock is ticking. I have to go do this. This isn't something where I can just wait a week and get back to it because, you know, hopefully what I'm doing will have a positive impact. And uh, of course, that's why I said yes to this panel because I, I didn't want to, I didn't want to wait around and not have it happen. Um, oh, I've got an idea. I've got an idea oh. for the last three, three minutes. Let's do it. Can I have a, a crazy random idea? I just thought, let's practice bringing a tiny bit of behavioral design into our conversation because we are a group. How many people are on this call? 36 people, we're a group. If we write down a tiny pledge, just practice the behavioral science that you can teach to your students. I've got a little notepad. I can write a pledge, something that you just wanna do in your personal life or with your students. And then if we all take a photo of it on the group Zoom, I bet you most of you will do it because you'll feel that we have promised to the group. Do you wanna do it? Mm -hmm. You can say no if you think it's a dumb idea, but just that's a little example of something to do with groups is really easy 
and then we will all feel that we have to keep our promise. Can I write it on my hand because I don't have any paper? Is that okay? Yeah, that is so eco-friendly that you don't have any paper. You're a paper maker. <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's weird, right? You want to do it? We're going to do it? You can say no. Look at this, how I recycle paper. This is a letter. So I use it for my notes. I have Perfect. all these envelopes a lot, you know, to share with you. <laughs> All right, I wrote in my hand. It's going to be backwards, right? Is this backwards? Yeah. No, it's forwards. It's already. Oh, that's right. For you. I did one. So this, what does yours say, Katie? Mine's very messy because I wrote it fast. Look, everybody's doing it. This is great. Mine says, I pledge to finish my environmental imagination landing page. I, I did two, and then go to the zero waste store once a week. Awesome. Who wants Can to someone read screen grab? Who's the leader? Is it um, Lisa? Is she the or coordinator yeah. who wants to screen grab everybody and post it somewhere? <laughs> You're going to be committed to this because it's going to be on the internet. Look, everybody's right? doing it. This is awesome. I want to screen grab it as well. Wanna, uh, ah. Yeah, take off your, your videos or put on your videos, I should say. Or put it in the chat. That's fine too. Smiling. Amazing, everybody. This is so fun. <laughs> See how easy behavior design is. Thanks Amazing. So Thanks. I think on that note, we probably should wrap up. So Eric, I don't know if you have any other final thoughts. Just that um, my, my final thoughts are that um, a lot of these uh, conversations I've had over the pandemic over at climatedesigners.org and I've met fantastic people, uh, including Katie and Lisa through that group, either directly or tangentially from other people there. And it's broadened my knowledge of what uh, we talked about today. So uh, I definitely encourage all of you as you're thinking about your teaching in the fall and, and beyond to uh, check out um, that, that website as well as um, the, the work that you saw today from Lisa and Katie and, and those in the links. And of course, the Climify podcast, which this uh, conversation will be on sometime probably in September. Amazing. Well, thank you so much. One more round of applause for all three of you. Thank you. Thank you. And Andrea, you did a phenomenal job in the chat. She was dropping links and finding <laughs> websites and fielding all of that stuff. So that was fantastic. Thank you, thank Andrea. You. Um, this was wonderful. I'm so like, again, my brain is on fire. Um, so uh, this is recorded. We will be posting it so you can all watch it again later. And then don't forget there's more, there's more shifted to come. So we have another session coming at you in half an hour. So come, go take a break and come back. We are gonna be hearing from um, a great panel talking about uh, shifting inside out, decolonizing the classroom. So another really fantastic, much needed topic. Um, so go take a break, come back. We'll see you soon. Thank you.